like I said, my name is Julia, and I've been a member of Bridgepoint for almost five years now. I came at the end of 2019, and there's a lot that is different in my life now versus in 2019, and one of the biggest things is that I am now a mom, and I have a three-year-old son named Ezra, and I have a three-month-old named Reese. He's actually right there, a little cutie. Um, and they're awesome. I love them so much. They are great. They test my sanity daily. They're amazing. And one of my favorite things about being a mom that I really didn't see coming was the community. Being able to be surrounded by other moms who, what it feels like, are just in the trenches with you. And maybe that sounds dramatic, but if you're a parent, you know, you're like, yeah, that's what it feels like sometimes. It feels like a war zone. It feels like there are days where you get to the end of that day and you're like, I don't really know how we made it, but we made it and everybody survived and that's a win. And it's hard. Parenting is hard. It's so good and it's so hard and we need community to be able to make that happen. I have this really wonderful, tight-knit group of moms uh, that I get together with on a regular basis. And most of the time, what it looks like is we're having our kids in tow and we're having a play date and they're basically destroying the house around us while we're <laughs> talking and sharing our hearts. But every once in a while, we get to have a special night out where we say, okay, you know, babysitter, grandparent, spouse, you take the kids. And I'm going to go out, you know, with, with my girlfriends, and I'm just going to have a night and not worry about the kids. And it's a really special thing. And so I had one of those nights a couple of weeks ago where I went out with a group of mom friends, and we just went and we hung out at downtown Woodstock. And this day that I had before that night was a rough one. <laughs> It was one of those days where I got to the end and I was like, I don't know. I don't know how I made it through this day. It was, it was rough and I was struggling. And it was to the point where I was like, I don't even want to go out. I just want to go to bed. I don't want to, I don't want to see friends right now. Like I just, I just want to, you know, cash in this day and say I'm done. But I really felt like it was important to take advantage of this kind of rare thing of being able to go out with my friends without, you know, without our kids. So I went. And I get there, and I, I had arrived a little bit late, and we're all, you know, sitting at this picnic table in downtown Woodstock. And one of the women at the table just goes, oh, Julia, how are you? And you know those times where you're like, please don't ask me how I am, because, like, I am this close to just breaking. And that's how it was. And so I was just like, keeping it together, and I'm like, I'm great, <laughs> doing awesome. And she comes around to the side of the table, and she just lets me pour my heart out. And every, you know, everybody else is talking and, and having a great time, and I'm just crying <laughs> and sharing with her everything that I'm feeling. And then at the end of the night, we're all, you know, going our separate ways, and another one of the moms walks me to my car so that I could share my heart with her, and she could hear and make sure that I was doing okay. And when I had gotten home, I had three texts making sure I was okay, saying they were praying for me. And I was so incredibly humbled and touched by that night that I had this amazing group of women that could see me so clearly. And it wasn't even like I was going through something particularly awful. I wasn't going through some life-shattering event. I just had a bad night. <laughs> I just had a bad day. I just felt like things weren't quite going my way. Things with the baby were rough. Things with the toddler were rough. I was being tested. But that didn't matter. All that mattered to these women is that they saw that they needed, that I needed someone, and they all showed up for me in their own ways. And I think this is so key as Christians. It's not just as a mom, but no matter what season of life we're in, we need that tight-knit community where we can show up for one another and so the topic of today's talk is how to show up for your people. Because community is so important. There's this quote by Francis Schaeffer that says, our relationship with each other is the criterion the world uses to judge whether our message is truthful. Christian community is the final apologetic. Jesus says that the world will know that we're Christians by our love for one another. 
that if we claim to represent the name of Jesus Christ, we have to look like him. And one thing that he did really well was he showed up and he loved the heck out of the people around him. He fed people, he listened to people, he saw people, he healed people. And we need to be willing to show up for the people around us. And I think that it's so important that the enemy likes to use roadblocks to get us to not show up. And I think that there are three major roadblocks that stop us from showing up for the people around us. And the first is bitterness. And bitterness is unforgiveness in our hearts when someone hurts us or betrays us, whether it's on purpose or not. And often it's somebody who is really close to us, somebody that had actually had access to a more vulnerable part of our heart that bitterness can really creep in if we get hurt. And this is not a new thing. This is something that as long as humans have been humans, <laughs> they've been betraying each other and feeling hurt. There's a psalm where David cries out to God in pain because a close friend has hurt him. Psalm 55, 12 through 14 says this, Now it is not an enemy who insults me, otherwise I could bear it. It is not a foe who rises against me, otherwise I could hide from him. But it is you, a man who is my peer, my companion, and good friend. We used to have close friendship. We walked with the crowd into the house of God. I think it's really interesting. He's, he's saying it's harder because it was a close friend. That I think a lot of times when we get hurt by an enemy, it's easier to bear because we expect it in a way. We say, yeah, like, all right, been there, done that. Like, I already don't get along with this person. There's a reason why, you know, maybe I consider them my enemy. But if it's a close friend, someone that knows your heart, someone that's walked with you, someone that's done life with you, that when they hurt you, it stings so much worse. And we've all felt this betrayal at some point in our lives, and Jesus felt it too. I want to tell the story of the betrayal that Jesus went to, but it's actually not one you're thinking of. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background. Jesus, when he went to the cross... All of his disciples at one point had left him and betrayed him. But there was one in particular. It came from his inner circle. It came from a man that had vowed just hours earlier that he never actually would betray him. And how did Jesus deal with this betrayal? Did he cut him off? Did he give up on him? Let's find out. So Jesus had dinner with his disciples before he went to the cross, and he reveals to them that one of them is going to betray him, and he's referring to Judas, who's going to sell him out to the Pharisees, and he's going to be arrested and tortured and taken to the cross. And Peter, gotta love Peter, he's so brash, he puts his foot in his mouth, he just really loves to like shout up instantly, and he goes, Lord, I would never, and he throws all the other disciples under the bus. He says, even if every single one of these betray you, I would never, ever betray you. And Jesus is like, sweet Peter, <laughs> even before the crow, the, the, the rooster crows three times, you're going to deny me three times. And, and, and Peter just can't believe it, but then it happens. And, and he's there and he's kind of looking off at a distance while Jesus is being arrested and somebody comes up to him and says, hey, hey, don't you know Jesus? And he's like, no, I don't know him. And he denies him again and again and again. And Jesus goes to the cross alone and betrayed <laughs> and denied by his closest friends. And he dies and he comes back. And after he comes back, there's a story where he meets Peter on the beach and Peter is out fishing. He's doing the thing that he was doing when Jesus first found him. And we can see almost like he's covered in shame. And he's saying, you know, what, what have I done? And he's letting that stop him from continuing his mission. And so Jesus gives him breakfast. And after they eat breakfast, this really beautiful conversation happens where Jesus asks Peter, he says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, you know that I love you. And he says, feed my lambs. And then he asks him again, Peter, do you love me? He's like, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. 
He says, shepherd my sheep. And he asks him a third time, Peter, do you love me? And he's just so distraught. He says, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. And I think there's two really beautiful things going on in this story. The first is that Peter had denied Jesus three times. And then Jesus gives him three opportunities to say, I love you. And I think that's such a beautiful picture of redemption that God always gives us a second chance. He always gives us another shot. He always forgives us. But there's another cool thing that's going on in this passage that we don't see until we look at the original language. So you might know that in Greek, there are multiple words for the word love. And if you ever want to look into this, C.S. Lewis has a great book called The Four Loves, super fascinating. Um, And two of these loves are actually used in this passage. So one, I think that we hear about a lot as Christians, is the agape love. And it's talked about the God love, the kind of love that God loves us with. And it's this higher, unconditional, sacrificial love. And that's true. But another piece that we often don't talk about that was very much in a Greek person's mind when you said agape was that agape was seen as a love not motivated by feelings. It was not the feeling love, it was the verb love. It was the action love. So when Jesus was healing people, that was an action of love. That was the agape love. There's another kind of love that friends have for one another called philia. And this is a very passionate, intense, feeling motivated love. And it's the kind of love, it actually comes from the root of soldiers that are fighting in battle together. This idea of I would lay down my life for you because we are comrades in arms. You are my friend. So Jesus asks Peter, Peter, do you agape love me? And Peter says, Lord, I philia love you. And Jesus asks him again, Peter, do you agape love me? And Peter says, Lord, I philia love you. And then Jesus says, Peter, do you philia love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I philia love you. And I think that's so, so interesting. And I don't think that in Peter's mind, he was saying, I don't love you this higher amount. I think he was actually kind of doing the classic Peter thing of trying to bring it to another higher level of saying, no, 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 I don't just love you in action. Like, I have such passionate affection for you. But Jesus, to me, I think what he was saying is, that's great. And we can start there. And I think that's why he uses philia the third time is because he knows that sacrificial love starts with affection and starts with that passion. But we have to take it a step further. And we have to say, when you're scared by the fire and there's, you're up against maybe being arrested, maybe being tortured, maybe being put to death yourself, are you going to love me despite what you feel? Are you going to love me regardless of how scared you are or if you're angry or if you're bitter or if you're hurt? And I think this is when Jesus asks us to agape love. He's not saying don't he's not saying love without feeling, but he's saying love regardless of what you're feeling. And often love is going to come with feeling, but it has to still be there. We have to still show up for one another even when we don't feel like it. We have to still show up for people around us even when it's hard, even when we're scared, even when we're angry. Colossians 3, 13 through 14 says, Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you have a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Above all, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. The cure for bitterness is forgiveness and unconditional love. I love that Jesus didn't even question it. He just goes into that scenario with Peter. He has already forgiven him. He is already ready to say, let's move on. Let's continue my mission. Let's continue loving people. Let's continue bringing heaven to earth. But he had to start with the forgiveness of the betrayal so that bitterness wouldn't take root. And we have to do the same. I think there's a common verse we might go to when we're talking about bitterness, when we're talking about betrayal, where Hebrews talks about 
as far as it relies on you, be at peace with everyone. Make every effort to be at peace with everyone. And so then we can kind of look at that and say, okay, but what if the person that is in this scenario doesn't want to be at peace with me? What if they take every opportunity to belittle me or to shame me or to put me down or to hurt me, betray me, whatever? What do I do then? And I think, again, we have to look at what Jesus did because when Jesus was being tortured and humiliated and put to death, he cried out for the forgiveness of the people who were doing the torturing. And this concept of laying down your life for your enemies is not an easy one, and it's certainly not a popular one, especially in this culture where everything is all about my rights, and I need to, to cut out these toxic people in my life, and I have to stand up for myself when Jesus actually tells us to lay down ourselves for someone who might even be trying to hurt us. It's our call as Christians, as followers of Jesus, to lay down our lives to pray for our enemies. The second roadblock to showing up for people around you is busyness. And this happens when we get so distracted by everything that's going on around us, we get so wrapped up in our own lives that we don't see the people around us. Luke 10, 38 through 42 says this. While they, this is the disciples and Jesus, were traveling, he entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks and she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So tell her to give me a hand. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice and it will not be taken away from her. I think that we can kind of maybe get on Martha a little bit in this story and be like, yeah, duh, you know. But, but how often can that be what we do is we get so distracted by making sure the house needs to be cleaned or making sure that people need to be fed or making sure that our kids get to the sports on time. And these are all important things. These are all necessary things for our life. But what Jesus is making the point of is that they're secondary things and that time with him has to be primary and y'all, I am so passionate about this, and I am so bad at this. My dad says this thing where he says, the best kept secret of Christians is Christ. Where we're so bad at remembering that it's about that relationship with him. It's about spending that time with him that has to come first before anything else. Jenny Allen has this great quote that she says, we get the great commission when we get the greatest command. I love that because it's basically saying that we can't serve or love the people around us unless it's an outpouring of our relationship with Jesus. We have to spend time sitting at the feet of Jesus if we want to then turn around and love the people around us. This is so key. This is, I believe, the most important aspect of our Christian walk is spending time with our Lord. And what that looks like even in a season of busyness, and honestly, especially in a season of busyness, it means prioritizing time with him. If you're making that the primary, it means that you're not trying to fit time with Jesus around your schedule or around the other things in your life. It means that you need to fit the other things in your life around your time with Jesus. It means that you need to be with him and sit with him every single day, even when you're busy, because that is what is going to give you the strength, and that's what's going to allow the Holy Spirit to guide you into seeing the other people around you. And while you're just doing life and all these things that are important and that matter, the Holy Spirit is going to give you little nudges and say, look, this person needs you. Look, this person needs love. Look, this person needs a kind word that maybe we wouldn't have seen otherwise if we were so caught up in the busyness. So the cure for busyness is sitting at the feet of Jesus. It's time with Jesus. The third roadblock that gets in the way of us showing up for people is fear. And I think a lot of times this can look like fear of rejection. 
that we're scared that maybe people are gonna think that we're weird or that we're overstepping our boundaries. Like if it looks like someone's having a hard day and you're like, I don't wanna like go ask them if they're okay because you know, what if they just, what if they get offended? What if, what if they think, you know, and we, we start to get this loop and we let the enemy lie to us and tell us that the fear is more important than people being loved and people being seen. And the re- so the cure for fear is we have to have security in our relationship with Jesus. There's this verse that we often use that's if man is against me, then, or if God is with me, who can be against me? And I think a lot of times we, we hear that verse and we think, oh, okay, so if God is with me, no one is against me. But that's, that's not true. Like people are still against you. Even Jesus says in this world, you will have trouble. But the truth of that verse is that it changes our perspective that when God is with us, we don't have to fear the rejection of man. We don't have to fear the hurt of man because we are accepted, we're safe in him. Isaiah 49, 15 through 16 says, can a woman forget her nursing child or lack compassion for the child of her womb? Even if these forget, yet I will not forget you. Look, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. And John 10, 27 through 30 says, My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Jesus was rejected by this world so that we could be accepted by him. And because we are accepted by him, we then can love freely and without fear the people around us. We don't have to have an agenda. We don't have to be trying to get something from them, a certain reaction, or or think that a relationship has to look a certain way. We can just love and just show up. And whatever they do with that, that can be with them but we can be faithful when we're secure in our relationship with Jesus. I think that everyone here knows the power of having someone show up for you. We need to use that strength that is given to us to show up for someone else. So some of you may know that when I had my son, my first, my oldest, Ezra, I suffered from very severe postpartum depression I was suicidal, and I was really, really struggling with it. And on top of that, I had this shame of feeling like I had to hide what I was feeling. And I was so convinced that I was the worst mother in the world that no one had ever had these thoughts that I was having before. And I was so convinced that no one could know because people, people would think I was a terrible mother. And I had had all these people tell me, like, Motherhood is this beautiful thing, and it's so magical, and it's like love at first sight, and it's this beautiful, magical, joyous thing, even when they're screaming for five hours straight and blowing out all over you. And it's like, this is not my experience. I'm not seeing this. I don't understand. What am I missing? And I just kept thinking I was bad or wrong for how I was feeling. And thankfully, my mother-in-law, she saw me, She saw what I was going through, and she shared with me how she had struggled with postpartum depression and how when she had had her oldest, she wanted to give him away. And being told that it broke the lie of the enemy that I was alone. And the enemy wants to use that lie because it's such a powerful lie because the truth is that we're not alone, that there are people around you that have been through what you're going through. And we need those people to show up for us. And the fact that we have been through things, we need to then use that and show up for the people around us. So I'm super passionate now about motherhood and struggling with mental health, especially in that newborn stage because I've lived through it. I had a mom who came to visit me. She's been a friend for a long time. And and she came to visit a couple months after her baby was born. And I could tell she was just kind of like not really wanting to say something. And so I ended up just going for it. And I told her some of my story and and how I had struggled with postpartum depression. 
And she got a little brave and she just said, I just, people talk about, like they say I'm supposed to love it and I'm just not sure I do. And I was like, oh, I hated it. Like I hated being a mom in the beginning. And you're not supposed to say that. Like, no, you're supposed to love every second of it. And even now I don't love every second of it, but but I do love it now. I love being a mother. And it was so cool because I was able to do two things for her in that moment. One, I was able to show her, you are not alone. I have felt how you are feeling. But two, I was able to show her, it gets better. I was able to talk to her about the relationship that I now have with my son, how I'm doing now mentally because of the courage that my mother-in-law gave me that I was able to get help. I was able to talk to doctors and get help. And I was able to see the other side and know that it can be better. And all of us, we have something, whatever that thing is that you've lived through, that in the moment you thought, I don't know how I'm gonna live through this. Somebody else is having that moment now and they need to know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. First Corinthians says that God comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those with the comfort that we have received. So the thing that we got, where somebody showed up for us, the miracle that God gave us, we need to then extend that out to somebody else. We can't just keep it to ourselves. We cannot be spiritual hoarders. We have to take what we've been given and we have to show that hope and show that love to someone else. So I'm just gonna ask, what is it that God has given you a heart for? And is there some, have you been through a season that now you're on the other side of and you see the hope of, but when you were in it, you didn't see the hope of? And then can you see someone around you who maybe they're in that season right now and they need to hear that they're not alone and that it gets better? So what does this look like practically? Because I think, you know, it's easy to say, like, okay, show up for people. But then it's like, well, what what does that mean? Or maybe you're in a season of life where you're like, I I just don't feel like I have the capacity. I'm working 90 hours a week. Or or I I am in my newborn stage. Or just so much is going on with, with my kids. Or my health isn't good. Or whatever. But I think that we all have something. We all have a step and a way that we can show up for other people. I've got three easy, practical ones for you right now. Number one is check in with a friend. And this can be as easy as a text or a call. And it's two questions. How are you? How can I be praying for you? And those two questions, y'all, they open up so much. They give people a door to just totally let it all out. And they can choose to say like, I'm doing good. Don't really need prayer for anything right now. And that's okay. That's okay. But often I think you will find that they'll start to open up a little bit and the more that you ask that question on a regular basis of how how are you and how can I be praying for you, the deeper that relationship will get and the more vulnerable they'll get and the more that they'll trust that you're showing up for them. Number two is to fill a need that you see. And this can be small, it can be big, it can be whatever you have the capacity for. I recently had the very awful experience of having to take my newborn to the ER. Um, It was truly terrible, probably the worst two days of my life. Um, And I had a friend who, when she found out that we were at the ER, she door dashed us Panera to the hospital. And I'm sure that to her that felt small. But to me and my husband, it felt so big because we felt so seen and I hadn't eaten all day and I was so stressed and we were just in and out of tests and to just be able to like eat some broccoli cheddar soup, like it just helped so much and it brought so much comfort in one of the lowest moments of my life. And that's, it can be that easy. It can, you don't even have to make somebody a meal. You don't have to cook for somebody if you don't want to, you can just, send them a meal through through a service like that or you can cook for them or or even if you're like hey I see this this couple and it just seems like man they really need a date night so I'm going to text them and I'm going to say hey when is a good time in the next couple weeks I'm going to babysit for you 
As a parent, I'll tell you, that one's big. That one's a good one. Or maybe if you see somebody financially struggling, could you cover a bill for them? Just relieve some of that financial pressure. I know there's a million other ways to show up for people. But those are just a few that came to my mind. And the third way to practically show up for people is to prioritize regular community. And this means spending intentional, regular time with your people. And if you feel like you don't have people, you need to find your people. You're like, I, I can't really show up for anyone because I don't really feel like I have my people. It's time. We are not meant to do this alone. It's so important, it's so key. And like I said, one of the number one tools the enemy is to tell us that we're alone. So it's time to get in a life group. It's time to reach out to someone that you're like, I don't really know them, but I think they're kind of cool. I feel like maybe we could get along. Invite them to coffee. Maybe that's scary, but I, I promise you, I really don't think that people are gonna be like, ew, no, I don't wanna hang out with you. If they do, all right, just, you know, go on to the next person. <laughs> but, but it's time for us to find our people and whatever that looks like for you. If you're like, okay, I go to the gym every single day and there's somebody else that every time I'm at the gym, I see them. Go ask them to work out together. I don't know. You know, if there's a friend, that I, I have a friend who we were pretty close, but I wouldn't say we were super close. <laughs> and she's now my best friend because all we started doing was about once a week, we would walk a couple miles together with our kids in the strollers and we would walk to a coffee shop. And just that like hour, hour and a half that we did once a week, that deepened a relationship so much. And now she is one of my people. And so yeah, it takes work, it takes intentionality. With that friend, it took us texting each other back and forth several times until we finally figured out exactly how our schedules could sync up on a regular basis. It is, it's hard, especially, it's hard to make friends as an adult. One really easy way, join a life group. It's like a little plug for like Bridgepoint's life groups. It is, and yeah, sometimes it's awkward when you first join and you don't know anyone, but I'm telling you, you get out of it what you put into it. And if you put yourself there and you get vulnerable, and you talk to people and you say, hey, can I get your number? You're gonna find your people, it's gonna happen. And when we have regular community, our friendships deepen. And then when somebody is going through something, we can see it. I like that Matt likes to talk about, you know, you can hide something from somebody for, for a few weeks, but over, months and years, it's a lot harder to hide the things that are going through your life. And I think that's really good because we're not meant to hide. We're not meant to buy into the lie that we're alone. We're meant to share what is going on with the people around us to get that support so that people can show up for us and so that we can show up for other people. We're gonna go ahead and go into a time of communion like we do every week. We have the elements at tables around the rooms. We also have our prayer stations where you have note cards and that's just between you and the Lord. And there are also candles that you can light that's been shown throughout church history as sending a prayer up to heaven. And as you're taking communion, I want you to remember what it's for. That it's a time of remembrance of what God has done for you, what he has brought you through that because of the sacrifice that Jesus made, that we are changed, that we have hope, that we have a path to life. And then I want you to ask God, okay, now who is one person that I can show up for this week? What is one way that I can show up for someone this week? And trust that he will give, he will bring someone to mind Maybe someone, it might be random or it might be someone really close to you that you just need to send a text to. Sometimes you'll be surprised. I have a friend who on a very regular basis, she texts me those two questions. How are you? How can I be praying for you? She just tells me she's been thinking of me. And I don't know if she knows how much those texts mean to me. And I think that the Holy Spirit talks to her because a lot of times those texts come when I'm having a hard time. And so trust, trust that the Holy Spirit is gonna guide you to love the people around you. Let's pray. 
Father, you are so good. We are so grateful that we can show up for people only because you first showed up for us. In a moment when we deserved it the least, and that you continue to show up for us in our lives. God, we just ask for confidence and bravery to take the comfort that we've been given and comfort someone else, show up for someone else, love someone else. Teach us how to look like you, how to bring heaven to earth. We love you and we praise you in your name. Amen.